makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. A very good morning and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Manish Granny in Dubai. Here's what's coming up on our show today. European stocks drop, but U.S. futures rebound ahead of a key week for central banks, with the Fed and the ECB both expected to hike. Spain's IBEX drops after an inconclusive election with the Socialist Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez and his Conservative opponent both claiming victory. Plus, European earnings ramp up, shares in Ryanair drop over caution about traffic growth in the coming year, while Julius Burr profit jumps on inflows from Credit Suisse. Firmly in contraction, the European manufacturing sector, the composite, comes in at 48.9. Services are still expanding. We've had quite a bruising from the French and the German PMIs. Of course, Germany is the lowest reading in 2023 in contraction. France, a 32-month low, but on a pan-European basis. And the reason why you're seeing such a hot uh, flash in Spain is, of course, uh, the election, an undecided uh, an undecided electorate delivers prevarication at a political level. But the Eurozone private sector contracts. It's a dire start to the second half of the year. So manufacturing is the Achilles heels of the euro. We will see the euro against, uh, and this is a, a much broader measure uh, of the euro, which is its effective exchange rate is at an all-time high, which belies what's happening with the euro dollar there. The euro dollar on the cross, the euro drops like a stone at 11080. The challenge for the ECB as they meet this week is, of course, the value of the euro on a relative basis to a basket of currency. So that's the state of play on the manufacturing uh, for both the services and the uh, manufacturing size. Let's just take a look across the assets for you. It is a huge week uh, for the central banks. The Fed, the ECB uh, and the UK will probably deliver one more punch uh, on the upside. Now, with that in mind, uh, it's really a case of hit me baby one more time. As far as the bond markets are concerned, 382 is where we are in 10s. Bill Gross says that the bond Bulls, a rally is not on the cards. Hoisington said a credit crunch is on the way. That could take the yields lower. The oil market just uh, breaks a four-week trend on the upside. Uh, we're firmly in backwardation uh, with a 30-cent backwardation. And Mazrui, the UAE oil minister, says the cuts are adequate to balance the market. I pop in dollar-yen because the outlier on the tail risk event of the week is, of course, the Bank of Japan. Not expected to remove yield curve control. However, they did disrupt the market last December. Could they do it again? with something a little bit more spectacular. And commodities will dig deeper uh, into the commodity spectrum later in the show. Wheat is up uh, on a bombardment of some of the ports uh, around Odessa. Let's talk a little bit more detail about the PMIs. We have Will Horobin from Paris. Will, good to have you with me. Uh, in terms of the overall dynamics here, the services falls to 51.1 from 51.6, but still in expansion. The Achilles heel is manufacturing for the Eurozone. Good morning. Good morning, Manus. Yeah, um, manufacturing is really pulled down. The uh, to, to, we were at eight month low for the um, composite, and for manufacturing, it's a it's a three year low. Um, and you say services is kind of the saving grace in some ways, but it is still slower than it was. The expansion is still slower than it was earlier in the year. So the 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 picture is really quite grisly this morning. Drizzly. But, of course, what's it going to mean for the ECB? And, and I ask that because they're caught between a rock and a hard place, aren't they? They have the euro, which has been flying high, and the, the nominal exchange rate is at an all-time high. I know it's dropped a little bit uh, this morning on the back of the disappointment. But for the ECB, are they really in the one more, one more hike and done? Are we at the end game for the ECB? Well, I think... It's almost, I mean, it's completely baked into everyone's expectations that they will raise by 25 basis points to 3.75% for the deposit rate this week. Um, it's extremely unlikely that any of this data would change any of that. But it does, it does make it, you know, a bit more cautious for what's, what's going to happen over the summer. Um, what we're really looking at on Thursday is any indication of, of what they think they might do in, in September. And, and this, like, very poor reading for PMI definitely feeds into that calculation. 
OK, a, a, a lot to consider. Let's see if Madame Lagarde can uh, navigate that news conference uh, later in the week. Will, thank you very much. Will Horobin there on the PMIs. My guest this morning to discuss markets is Human Edge Investment CIO Mads Pedersen. Mads, always good to get your take. I know you're in the process of de-risking at the moment, but please square away for Europe for me. I'm caught between the effective exchange rate of the euro, which is an all-time high. Yeah, it drops a little bit this morning. How much of a, let's say, spoiler will the value of the euro be in the consideration of the forward guidance for the ECB? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, Manus. I think it's a, it's a disaster in their own making. Um, the, the exchange rate is clearly too high for the exporters and for the manufacturing sector to struggle or to, to live well in a global manufacturing recession. Uh, we know that the European markets are Europe and China to a large extent, Asia, and so they're struggling there. And ECB now needs their policy. They started too late to work faster. But the problem is they're impatient. So they want to hike and show strength when they actually should show caution and let their policy work. 3.75 is, is, is tight enough for Europe. Um, and they have put themselves in this, in this unfortunate place by starting too late. And um, so, so we don't hold much in European equities, to be clear, if we want to talk a little bit about markets. And we don't hold much belief that ECB will get it right. That's, that's the conclusion. But you've always, been, you've always been a man that's been straight to the point on your criticism. What I'm trying to understand from you is you are, from my take, you are de-risking the portfolios. You're going from 60 to 40 on equity. And you're shifting from high yield to high growth bonds. So just give me a sense of the scale of your de-risking. Yeah, so we went from 100 to 60 equities and from 60 to 40, depending on whether you look at a growth portfolio or a balanced. And we maintain the high yield. Uh, we have very short duration in the high grade bonds. So we have taken off a lot of equity beta. We took that off at the end of June uh, because we think it's risky with this the manufacturing recession potentially spreading to, to the rest of the world. That's pretty, pretty much of a de-risking. And then because the now it's the summer season here in Europe, so we can say because the, the central banks are flip-flopping a bit around on their communication, we still have very high volatility in the government bonds. So there we have pretty short duration. So we have been buying like two-year, four-year duration instead of buying four or six-year duration. So with the aggregate duration in the government bonds we have been buying to protect the portfolios is lower, two years lower than normally. Um, and we have been taking off, okay. you'd say, all the overweight inequities. We held it for seven months before. Okay. What, what are you preparing for? It's interesting that you say maybe the manufacturing recession in Europe may be something which is a catalyst for the rest of the world. I'm going to flip that back at you. I'm going to look at the New York Fed, yeah. uh, and they've got the probability of a recession. I mean, everybody's telling me it's going to be a, a soft landing, Mads. I, I don't need to worry. Unemployment is going to be grand. We're going to be fine. Five and a half percent rates. We're all going to be, ah, oh, we're off to the races, buddy. New York Fed tells me something different. New York Fed is a 60 percent probability of a recession and a brutal one if I go by history. Um, is that part of the reason why you're de-risking? Are you in this? Are, you're obviously not drinking the soft landing Kool-Aid, are you? Well, I think we have been drinking this off landing Kool Aid, as you call it, for seven months. We were overweight equities, but now the, the, the world has split in two in the sense that services are doing fine, as, as we just heard, and manufacturing is a deep recession. We need to see the earnings coming through decently before we can go back on an overweight. Because at the moment, the, the, the economy is weak and the central banks are unclear about how much more they will tighten. So this is the whole problem is mm -hmm. that there is a big risk that they would like to take us into a deeper recession. And this is exactly what your chart shows, that the unbiased probability, if you look at the data, not if you, you're talking your story, but if you look at the data, as you know, we like to do, then the probability of something going wrong has been going up the last two months because the macroeconomic signals in our models and what you see from the New York Fed, well, that macroeconomic signal is getting weaker. At the same time, the risk around central banks overdoing it, as they sometimes do, when they tighten, when they ease, that has increased as well. That's why we need clarity from the central banks and we need clarity from earnings. Okay, the outlier is, of is course, the Bank of Japan. The, the outlier this week could be the Bank of Japan. Just yeah. briefly, I've written down here, what I'm focused on is the cadence, the caution and the calibration. Those are the three things for me. And what I want to understand from you is, um, 
the outlier risk, the tail risk this week is BOJ. Where do you think they will be on, 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 the, on the caution that they give to us, the guidance that they give to us? How important is that for the yen trade? It's, it's very important for the yen trade, but they're the ones who have the most to, uh, to benefit from taking it easy. And they are probably going to be the, the one taking it most easy because they have an economy which is improving for once. They have a market which is doing well, so they have the least reason to do anything uh, to upset this whole thing. They're also, they have been blamed for a lot of things the last 20 years, but they are the ones who have least contributed to the global inflationary problem. So they're in the best place to, to not surprise anyone, to be more cautious than everyone else. They're hiding out. You know the trade mads that sell that, that pad of yours in Gestad and buy yourself the summer pad uh, and buy yourself the, 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 win the winter pad in Japan. Reflect on that uh, and see whether you want to switch, you want to switch the, yen and yen, the, the Swiss into yen for that trade. I'll come back to you. I'll leave you to reflect on that. We'll be back with you in just a moment. That's the Human Age Investment CIO, Mads Peterson. Uh, coming up in the show, European earnings season is well underway with the banks and the luxury in focus. We look ahead to some of the companies due to report right here on Bloomberg. LVMH, Kering and Hermes. A touch of luxury, sir. back at the time, for example, at the merger of UBS and Bank of course, you for sure remember that. I think uh, market shares of the two combined banks in Switzerland reached as high as up to 40% and have then again normalized. So from a competitive standpoint, uh, um, no, there's nothing to complain. I think this is an open field. It's an open field for Julius Baer CEO, Philip Reckenbacher. Uh, speaking to me a little bit earlier in the day, the wealth manager's profits jumping on the new inflows from Credit Suisse uh, and other reasons as well. Let's stay with the European earnings story. Uh, we've got big luxury week this week, LVMH, Caring and L'Oreal, all due to report uh, for the quarter. We had big disappointment, didn't we? Alex Pearson's with me from Frankfurt, from Richemont. So an inauspicious backdrop to this. What do we need to know for this week? Good morning. Good morning, Manus. Um, that's right. We have uh, three large uh, luxury goods makers reporting this week. And this comes on the back of Richemont last week posting an unexpected decline in the U.S., which has spooked some investors because um, the U.S. is one of the biggest markets, along with China, for this sector. And any indication of a slowdown there, especially amid expectations that the U.S. could enter a recession in the second half, um, could, it could undermine sentiment in uh, for luxury goods. This also comes uh, on the back of data out of China showing a waning um, economic recovery there and also a deceleration in uh, consumer spending growth. So any indication from uh, LVMH or caring that uh, there was weakening sales trends in the second quarter or that there could be ex or the expectation that it could continue into the next few weeks and months uh, will be closely watched by investors. Now, we've also got a, a Bloomberg story uh, that Bluebell Capital has bought a stake in caring and called for changes at the Gucci brand. I mean, it's not that shocking they're calling for changes at Gucci, but do you think we get any updates on that? Yeah, that's right. So there have been some organizational changes. Bluebell um, reportedly wants to go further with those changes. Uh, it's unclear whether we'll hear anything this week from caring on that, but uh, certainly any updates to the strategy to turn around the brand, which has been trailing its peers in recent years, will be very interesting for the market. And, and any indication that um, discussions on the strategy with shareholders could be happening will also be very interesting. Okay, all eyes down for the big luxury brands this week. Alexander Pearson uh, with the very latest. Let's get back to my guest, Human Edge Investment CEO Mads Peterson uh, on China. Mads, you have zero allocation to Chinese equities. That's a bit of a, that's a bit of a, I could use some rude words, but that's a brave call, sir, is it? Or, or is that judicious? <laughs> I, I think it's reasonable. Um, I have tried for 10 years, maybe 20 years, to find out how many buildings, how many apartments there are in China. Everyone talks about the Chinese government, the Chinese technology, the leading in AI, they're leading in technology, and they still don't want to tell us how many apartments are there, how many houses are empty, how are the loans doing? And now we see a what I call an exceeding degree of, uh, of communication coordination. Everyone's saying the same thing uh, about it. So maybe it's going to do fine. Maybe the Chinese market will be fine. I just think the risk is extremely high. Um, and therefore, we prefer to have our allocations to, to the U.S., where 
you can say what you want, but at least the companies are producing revenues and we, we kind of know what's going on. Kind of. I mean, you've reflected here, Biden is calling Xi a dictator. Previous patterns, Mao, Lenin, Stalin, Putin, etc. I mean, you are, you are, I mean, this is a brutally pessimistic view. I mean, the rest of us are trying to earn a crust here, Mads, on, on the vicarious European China trade, on global trade with China. I mean, this is, this is a fairly big call on China related risks. Could it explode before the end of the year, or is it a long, slow burn? I think it's a long, slow burn. I, I'm not saying she is like these people, I'm saying he's moving in that direction, and that's dangerous. Um, and we saw it the previous week. Uh, suddenly, everyone in a business position with a voice in China coordinatedly comes with statements in the newspaper about how much they like Xi's policy and how much they like everything. It's it's not that they could not be right, but when you coordinate to that yep. degree, it looks like other people who have been coordinating top down, doesn't it? And this does not mean that people will believe it. Just because everyone says the same doesn't mean that it's necessarily right. We remember that. That also happened in 2008 in other countries. I'm, listen, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just sort of like having a little bit of a poke uh, in yeah. that, you know, I, 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 re I read the copy and why, why, not, why not poke the CIO? 31 measures of yeah. stimulus um, globally. I, I want to take it out to a sort of zoom out to a, a more global level. They are going to do stimulus, Matt. 31 measures, underwhelming, growth has been cut. What is the reflective issue for me from an investment perspective? Is it the yuan is steadied? Is it that I, I push more of an allocation? Again, you've emphasized U.S. What is the consequence? of an underwhelming response to China's reopening and stimulus? Well, the consequence is that we need to be careful with our global risk. What, what could turn around is, I mean, we have the numbers out of these, as you talked about before, out of the big luxury, luxury sales houses. And they have a good feeling for what goes on in China. So if we see these measures gaining traction, if we see some of the bad loans being transformed into or restructured, then it can be a positive story. It's also positive that China is starting to talk to the world, but they need to regain credibility. And until now, it's not what we're seeing. So I'm just saying we have a global manufacturing recession. We have a problem with the end demand from Chinese construction. We have a problem with the credibility of the communication out of China. So some clear data and what we got on the GDP numbers was anything but clarity. So we need data and we need credibility and then we can start investing. Otherwise, we unfortunately will have to await that the central banks could spoil the game here late in the recovery, and we might have to go defensive, fully defensive in the portfolios. That's what we'll find out in the coming weeks and months. Okay, stay focused. No holiday for you on the beaches, uh, sur la Côte d'Azur. That is the Human Edge Investment CIO, Mads Peterson. No, you're much more Spanish oriented. Speaking of which, uh, Spain's Socialist Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez and his right wing opponent both claiming victory after the elections that left them struggling to build a majority. We're live to Madrid with Maria Tadeo on the ground. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Pulse. The Spanish elections now and the country looks to be on course for gridlock. An inconclusive set of results left the parties both ends of the spectrum without a clear path to forging a government. Who's got the upper hand? Maria today has been tracking that. It's nail biter, hasn't it been? Uh, what will the Conservatives make of the results? Ms. Tadeo, good day. Yes, Manis, and it is a bittersweet, to some extent, victory for the Conservatives because we should make it clear they won the election yesterday. They won the most seats and the most votes. But the way the Spanish parliamentary system works, that is not enough. You need a majority. You need a working majority in the lower house that you see behind me. And at this point, they do not have the numbers. And even if they were to go into a coalition with Vox, for some, this is a far-right party, Vox will describe themselves as Spanish uh, patriots, that would still not be enough. So it is unclear that conservatives, having won the election, will actually get to be in power. Now, that opens a window of opportunity for the Spanish uh, socialists, who yesterday were almost celebrating as if they had won the election. They say that should the conservatives fail, they will try to form a different majority. The problem for both men, both on the conservative side, but also the socialists, is the combination 
company they keep. It is clear now that Vox continues to be a red line for a big number of Spanish voters that will go out and vote to prevent what they perceive as a far-right government. And for the Spanish caretaker Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez, he depends at this point or would depend on Catalan nationalists. And in particular, let's go back in history, he would depend on a man that in 2017, Puigdemont, declared independence from Spain for 30 seconds, but nonetheless did it, and then fled the country in the back of a car. With friends like that, obviously, it's very difficult to form a government. <laughs> it is. One, one, one could say it's a, a reputational risk. Maria, good to see you. Maria today there uh, in Madrid tracking the election results. Coming up on the show, we're going to take a look at the UK economy. How is it faring? What are the latest PMIs there? In just a moment. European stocks seesaw, but U.S. futures rebound ahead of the key week for central banks, with the Fed and the ECB both expected to hike. Spain's IBEX drops after an inconclusive election, with the Socialist Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez and his Conservative opponent both claiming victory. Plus, European earnings ramp up, shares in Ryanair drop after caution about traffic growth in the coming year, while Julius Burr profit jumps on inflows from Credit Suisse. A very good morning. It's The Pulse with me, Manus Krenny, in Dubai. The PMIs were tragic, to say the least, in Europe, firmly in contraction zone for manufacturing. Yes, the price rises have been less aggressive than they were in the past 29 months, but the result was the euro dropped against the dollar. I can tell you, though, however, the euro is the most expensive on record on a nominal and effective exchange rate. And that's something the ECB will take into consideration when they look at this. The private sector contracts. It's a dire start to the quarter. The composite PMI comes in at 48.9. That is below the 49 Six. Now, when it comes to the actual narrative from the United Kingdom as well, we just have the breaking numbers coming through across your Bloomberg terminal for that. Uh, here we have services still in expansion, but again, a, a quite a significant drop, 51.5. The market had a survey in there of 53. But wow, on manufacturing, there's the pound. Down she goes. By the way, the pound lost over 1.83% in the space of six days. We're adding to those losses and those wounds. The CPI uh, trailed estimates last week. That took the narrative away from the Bank of England having to go into super hike mode. Uh, the risk of a full 50 basis points came off the table. Now the PMIs on the UK side come in at 45 on manufacturing. That's below the estimate. Uh, and as I say, the composite at 50.7. So on a composite basis, we are not in recession. We're not in contraction in the United Kingdom. But new orders are falling. Uh, and uh, I can tell you this, uh, you're, you're looking at 50.7. Uh, a year ago, that was at 52.1. It's the lowest reading since January of this year. Well, let's dig a little bit deeper into some of these numbers. The UK uh, numbers have just hit the tape. Christine is with me, Christine Aquino. Good to see you, Christine. So these PMIs, I mean, the pound is reacting, but it builds the narrative, I think, for the Bank of England, really, to kill the 50 bips and lock in the 25? Absolutely, man. I mean, that's definitely the debate, whether the Bank of England goes one way or another. We still don't really have any indication. And, of course, policymakers are already in their quiet period, so we're going to have to wait until next week for all of that. But, yeah, just looking at the numbers today, I mean, disappointment across the board. As you mentioned, manufacturing deeper into that contraction territory and services, even though that's still in expansion, uh, still quite a large drop. And I think that gels with the reaction that we've seen in a pound as well. You know, last week or the week before we hit a 15 month high and we really went through some big figures in a pound over a, a, a couple of weeks earlier in July and as you mentioned over the course of six days or so it's lost a lot of that momentum and I think it explains uh, today's number explains a lot of why there seems to be quite the ceiling for the pound right there seems to be this sense that the best of the UK economy is potentially behind us and it's now kind of catching up to the rest of the global economy economy in terms of that slowdown in both demand and also in terms of the economic momentum as a whole. 
And I think this is where the, the bigger debate comes in. Bill Gross warns that he sees a continued bear market in bonds. But then I was looking at this other story from Hoisington. A credit crunch is coming. They are looking at the real average hourly earnings, Christine, coming in at 2.9%. We get U.S. GDP this week as well. So there's a lot on the slate. Where's the biggest outlier risk for you? Mads Peterson says it's in Japan. Where is the outlier risk for you? Well, man, it's I mean, a lot of events this week, as you mentioned. Of course, Japan are very much in focus because they're the last out of the gate, really, to come out of this very easy expansionary policy uh, across the different developed nation central banks. I'm still going to have to watch the Fed, though, of course, because, again, we're going to be watching for not just what they're going to be doing in July, which is, of course, a rate hike that's basically all but nailed on, but I'm really very interested in kind of that forward guidance, right? I mean, if we get an indication from Jay Powell and his colleagues that this might be the beginning of the end of the Fed's rate hiking cycle. That's going to be very, very significant. Or, you know, classic Jay Powell, he's going to want to maintain optionality and want to insist that the Fed is data dependent. That might be the base case scenario. But any diversion from that sort of line from the Federal Reserve is potentially significant moving forward in the second half. Okay, uh, Christine, thank you very much. We'll keep an eye and an ear on all of that in terms of the caution uh, from some of the central banks on the forward guidance. When it came to the earnings for Julius Burr, have a look at this. It was a pretty, pretty strong momentum for uh, Philip Reckenbecker. Profit jumping. Uh, they've got inflows from Credit Suisse. Net income up 18% in the first six months he was with me. He, he made it very, very clear that he wasn't that worried uh, about the Credit Suisse UBS merger, that there was room for everybody. We've benefited from the Credit Suisse UBS to some extent, but we've been able to generate net new money from a much broader array of sources. So not banking on the failure of Credit Suisse to fill the coffers there. Ryanair, uh, so Julius Bear up 7.71%, Phillips uh, down 6.8%, Ryanair uh, down 3.68%. Maybe they're going to have to cut for... This is really interesting because we've been traveling like Billio, and I've done three weeks of global travel, European travel. I was everywhere, right? The planes were full. He's got a 95% fill on the seats, but they're saying that they may need to use some fur stimulation. They're, they're, they're still sending the flag up. Maybe we're running to the end of this gorging on stimulus that we have had in a post-COVID world. When Ryanair are telling you that they may need to cut furs to fill those planes, I put it to you that is a very prescient guidance. Now, when it comes to Philips, uh, they, they order drop, outweighs the outlook. I think that's the bottom line for them. Second quarter operating profit exceeded expectations, but you're looking at an order drop, which is weighing on the market. They've got fewer orders uh, coming in than they would like. The chief executive officer, Roy Jacobs, uh, said in an interview this morning. So keep an eye on that. Uh, two canaries in the coal mine from manufacturing and the consumer. Be warned. Coming up, Soaring temperatures across Europe begin to threaten the food production. We look at what it might mean for the global food system on Bloomberg. Yes, there have been some, some, some issues. The weather has been... Uh, it's unseasonably warm in parts of Europe, um, but that said, we're still operating full schedules. Uh, we're still getting people in and out, uh, and people are coming and booking in, in high numbers as, thing, as things are. So we'll just continue to monitor the, the, the situations we go. In road, for example, you know, we're letting people who want to book onto earlier flights do so. Mm -hmm. uh, we're continuing to operate in the airports are open, and we'll, we'll continue to do so. But are you seeing people actually going for cooler? No, um, you know, we're into 36 different countries across Europe and we've seen no discernible change in booking trends at this point in time. Um, load factor is very high, so a 95% load factor uh, in the quarter just ended and continued to be strong into the, the peak summer period. So no, people are, are booking the traditional routes that they always did and, and we're fully booked on all of our, our, our routes. We've got 3,200 daily flights, 600,000 people a day flying with us um, and, 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 and doing so in numbers. That was the Ryan Air CFO, Neil Sorhan, speaking to Lizzie Burden a little bit earlier on, uh, on the consumer and the 
earth uh, impacts from uh, the heat wave that we have and it's continuing really to grip the whole of southern Europe. Around 19,000 people have fled parts of Greece hit by wildfires amid record temperatures across the region. The Greek Coast Guard led the efforts to rescue tourists and locals from the island of Rhodes and the blaze capped a week of extreme weather in the region. You've got hailstorms and a tornado in Italy, heavy rainfall in western Balkans as well. Well, the searing temperatures in Europe are starting to threaten the food production in the region, with the war in Ukraine already weighing on the global food supply. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook reports on short and long-term impacts of extreme heat in Europe. The risks to global food supply are multiplying. Already, Russia's invasion of Ukraine destabilized global fertilizer and grain supplies, but now there's another factor, heat. As Europe bakes under record-breaking temperatures, the effect on food is vast. Too much heat means crops mature very quickly and sometimes can't be picked in time, or they roast right on the branch. Heat and its consequence, drought. Too little water means huge swaths of produce never fully mature. Italian farming association Coldiretti estimates wheat production in Italy will be down 10% this year. It impacts animals too. Extreme heat means cows give less milk. It even exhausts bees hitting honey production. Coldiretti says financial losses will exceed the 6 billion euro figure from last year. All of this bears out in prices. Take Germany, which imports a huge amount of its food from Southern Europe. Inflation overall has been huge, but food prices have reached dizzying heights and everyone suffers as a consequence. It hits the farmers who lose crops, it hits consumers who pay more, and it even puts pressure on the ECB trying to get inflation under control. And while farmers are trying to adapt, it's hard to keep up with a brave new and hotter world. I've had my inbox filled with move to Ireland. It's uh, not as hot and perhaps a little bit less expensive. That is Bloomberg's Oliver Crook on the impact of record temperatures across Europe. Let's get a little bit more now with Caroline Bain. She's the chief commodities economist at Capital Economics. Caroline, thank you for being with us. El Nino, we are in the grip of El Nino. Uh, how underpriced is this in the commodity risk spectrum? I think it's starting to get priced in. Um, and as your previous um, article was, was saying, it's not just that extreme, extremely high temperatures in Europe. It, this is a global phenomenon. We've seen record temperatures in China. Southeast Asia had a drought last year. And on top of all that, an El Nino weather phenomenon is on its way, which is a, a warming phenomenon. It brings very dry weather to Asia and very wet weather to Latin America. Um, it typically results in, in lower production of some of the, the, the crops that are concentrated in those areas. So, for example, palm oil in Southeast Asia. It, it does feel as though there's a bit of a perfect storm um, developing in, excuse me, in agricultural markets, not least because of last week the Black Sea Grain Deal initiative um, expired and Russia has started targeting Ukrainian food export facilities. So, Yet another um, sort of factor driving, driving prices higher. Well, we've certainly seen an explosion in wheat. That's geopolitics at play. All ships will be treated as military cargo. There's been a tax on Odessa. When you look at that ramp higher in wheat, um, just talk to me from the supply side. We've now got a vicious heat wave in Europe. Where is the biggest supply issue? for the world when it comes to wheat? And how much more aggressive do you expect wheat prices to go? Um, we're in the process of revising up our forecast. We had expected the wheat price to ease back a bit this year after it's extremely high last year. Um, but we're, we're, we're revising that up. Um, looking at Europe, Europe's production of wheat, quite a lot of it is concentrated in the northern half of the region. And even France, um, which has experienced heat waves in the south, their harvests look on track, perhaps a, perhaps a little lower. So we're not hugely concerned about actual sort of European production of wheat. The, the end of the Black Sea grain deal, though, is, is, a, is a problem, um, as about 40 to 50 percent of Ukraine's um, wheat is coming out of the Black Sea. And the destruction of port facilities, et cetera, suggests that, you know, that's a while before Black Sea export can, can resume on any scale. Um, it, it's a big question mark how much Ukraine can get out um, over land. Um, 
and to and whether that can then be transported to markets in Africa and the Middle East who are specific Ukraine files. Carolyn, thank you so much. We're just gonna we're just gonna uh, uh, pause here, Caroline. Uh, we're just having a few. Uh, a few signed issues there. Our apologies to our viewers uh, on the signed during that interview. Caroline Bain, Chief Commodities Economist at Capital Economics, our guest this morning uh, on wheat and all things commodities. Coming up, the bird flies. Twitter bids farewell to the logo. We'll ask what the future holds for the social media platform right here on Bloomberg. The conversations that matter, insights that you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Manish Cranny in Dubai. So the simultaneous release of the movies Barbie and Oppenheimer helped the U.S. box office revenue this weekend more than double from a year earlier, more than $300 million. An estimated 200,000 moviegoers bought the tickets to see both the new films on the same day, a phenomenon that was dubbed Barbenheimer. Now, it helped cinemas turn in the best weekend since the Avengers Endgame made its debut in April 2019. So uh, Barbie's journey from the toy box to the big screen has been a long one. And on the latest episode of The Circuit with Emily Chang, executives at Mattel, who make the iconic dolls, discuss how they transformed the character into a blockbuster movie hit. The Barbie movie was kind of in development hell, wasn't it? How did you pull it out of that? Our approach was different. When we started this journey, the underlying objective was to create quality content, quality experience, and make a movie that people would want to watch. Kreis wasn't interested in making glorified toy ads, so he brought in a producer with big screen chops. You produced Dallas Buyers Club, which was nominated for an Oscar for Best Picture. What convinced you to come in-house and make movies for Mattel? the bench of, of the amazing IP that Mattel has. I mean, the hundreds and hundreds of brands owning Fisher Price and American Girl and Eight Ball and Hot Wheels and Barbie and Jack in the Box. It just, the list went on when I really, you know, looked deeply into it. I thought, my God, I grew up on so many of these brands. I have two children. They played with Barbie. They played with American Girl. And, you know, we have so much going on in the world right now. I mean, it's just a very kind of messy, crazy, time I think for everybody and I thought wow what better place to then to work at a toy company you're making things that actually bring smiles to children's faces that actually inspire wonder and imagination and just unlock incredible things for children and and for adults and the nostalgia that I had for all of these toys Barbie has a complicated history she is a cultural icon and a flashpoint what's the goal with the new Barbie movie Everybody has a relationship with Barbie. She's been around for so many decades and everybody knows who Barbie is. She's probably the most famous woman in the world. She's been to the moon. She's been president. <laughs> she's done all of these things that, you know, women aspire to be. And I think that, you know, in hiring somebody like Greta Gerwig, who I think is a uh, brilliant filmmaker, but she has a singular vision and an authentic voice as a filmmaker, bringing somebody like that that has just kind of a different perspective that is outside of the box that's gonna do something differently to something like Barbie, I feel like that's when sort of greatness occurs. This is Barbie's first theatrical release in her 60 plus year history. Why was now the right time and not 10 years ago or 20 years ago? It's interesting that of all of the movies at Mattel Films since we started on this journey four and a half years ago, that this is the first movie you would think in a lot of ways like that's a lot to live up to because it is an open-ended conversation she is an open-ended conversation like what is that movie greta had sort of this idea and i remember we met with her and she she said i have this idea of a high heel and a birkenstock and that was sort of her like leaping off point of like what this movie should be and i thought god that's kind of brilliant Kind of brilliant. I want more Barbies on if she's 60. Uh, Mattel executives there with Bloomberg's Emily Chang. Now brace yourself because the Twitter CEO, Elon Musk, has chosen a new logo for Twitter. The billionaire is replacing the signature blue bird with a stylized 
X. He's projected this all over uh, one of the buildings uh, in terms of what's happening here. He revealed the branding for Twitter um, in a tweet. So what does this all mean? I mean, the, the bird is 17 years old, but Elon has aspirations to create this product and take it to the, the payment services world. Let's get to Aggie Cantrell. She follows all things tech. She's just hot-footed it back from a New York trip. She's more inspired by tech than ever. Aggie, what's behind <laughs> the latest move? Good morning. <laughs> Hi, Manus. Yes, yeah, so essentially we have heard him already talk about X.com, about the everything app that he wants to build. He's been talking about this since October, since the original acquisition of, of Twitter. But now it seems like they're really pushing ahead with removing that Twitter brand. So it was a couple of ambiguous tweets from Elon Musk about what the, exactly this was going to mean. And then we got more from Linda Yasserino from the current Twitter CEO uh, when it came to essentially integrating audio posts, video, and also payments and banking. This is billed as some sort of WeChat, a WeChat analog um, for the Twitter space. And so essentially X.com, the idea of it, is something that Musk has been looking at for a long time. His original platform, uh, his payment platform back in the 90s was called X.com. He That was then merged with PayPal. And of course, we've heard of SpaceX and Model X. He has a bit of an obsession with the letter X. And so now when we're looking at this new X.com, Right now, it doesn't look like there's much beyond it just being the rebrand. But if you type in x.com at the moment, as I did in the Bloomberg office in Berlin earlier today, it just redirects you to Twitter. There you go. Bring, you know, it reminds me just like Simon Carl. Do you know, you're probably too young, but you remember the X Factor kind of thing? Um, that's uh, that's you know, the inspiration for Elon. <laughs> you do. Okay, okay. You probably were around for a bit. Even the head of the Middle East here is standing up. He remembers the X Factor. Yes, he wants to push me on to the X Factor. That's my next career. Uh, let's continue the conversation about Twitter. Uh, <laughs> because, of course, I, I mean, there's been a lot of upheaval. But what does it mean for the brand, Aggie? What does it mean for the brand? Briefly. Well, I think what you're saying about the X Factor is actually the point, is what is Twitter's X Factor? What is the thing that Twitter has that other people don't? And the thing is, a lot of that is the brand and the loyalty of it. So what I'm interested to see going forward is now that we've seen real competitors to Twitter come out, like threads from Meta, what does Twitter still have that it's offering to its users that maybe they won't find on another social media platform? And Twitter is a long-standing brand. We talk about tweeting just as we talk about Googling. So I really would like to see See what this means going forward for the app if it can still maintain a new strong brand with this x.com in the same way that Twitter has built up over the last uh, one and a half decades. Aggie, thank you very much. Let's see. Yeah, but of course, you've got to be a little bit wary. You sign up for threads and then you've got to demolish your Instagram account to get yourself off that. It's all, it's all very, very intricate. Aggie, well explained as ever. Aggie Cantrell in Berlin. There's only two things you need to know about the implosion in the European manufacturing and also the pound under pressure. Both the PMIs in the UK and in Europe are very much on an oppressive run. The pound is down for the seventh day in a row, the longest run of losses since the start of the pandemic in 2020. Is this peak pound?